Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. Well, it's a disaster, a danger, and tonight we are digging deep into what is going on at what used to be the Embassy Suites in Southfield. Glad you're with us for Local 4 News at 6. I'm Devin Skillian. I'm Kimberly Gill. The eyesore in question is hard to miss. It's along one of the busiest routes in and out of Southfield. The former Embassy Suites is on Franklin Road, but it can be seen from I-696 and Northwestern Highway. Looks like it could be a set piece from The Walking Dead. Sean Lay is there live. Uh, give us an up-close look at the problem here, Sean. You can see from the freeway, it's bad. Up close, absolutely awful lampshade found in the parking lot here. Here's what's going on. Look at the windows. People, kids getting in, finding it fun, I guess, to smash out the windows and then throw things outside. Flat screen TV. There is a bedding, a desk, a chair, ironing boards thrown out here. Now look, the city of Southfield had a long conversation with them today. They're in a court battle with the owner of this place, but that court battle is just as messy as this mess. Long story short, went into bankruptcy. Mike Shookman owns the glimmering one Northwestern Plaza in Southfield, his next door neighbor, a disaster and a danger. Owners not around, apparently not caring. So whatever, here what you go is you have, you know, basically urban scavengers or urban vandals going in there and just going in, throwing everything around. If you go higher up in our building, you can actually see the HVAC units have been tampered with. Everything's been sort of vandalized. Look at it from drone four. This is a wide open free for all people, kids smashing windows, throwing hotel furniture out of those windows after Embassy Suites bailed. Something called Southfield Ventures LLC bought the building. Court records show they haven't paid property taxes. They filed for bankruptcy. The city of Southfield in court arguing the bankruptcy is a delay tactic for the owners to not sink a dime into this. One thing to come out of court, the owners were ordered to put up a fence to secure the place, but it is flimsy. It's not sunk and cemented into the ground and kids are still getting in. This fence isn't keeping anyone out. You got to help us out here. And you know, the continued response from the city, the building commissioner was, it's out of our hands. Back here live, just standing here, there's an iron, an ironing board there, just stunning. This is just one side of this, guys. Look, now our guy we talked to said, the city said the hands are tied, but I had a long talk with the city administrator today and he says, it's really complicated here. One, the bankruptcy thing, it's chapter 11, they want to get to chapter seven, that would give the city more flexibility to go after the owner. Number two, they want to get the owner in circuit court. Look, there's fines here, there's blight tickets, all kinds of things, make a judge do something. But Devin, the LLC is so convoluted, so confusing, just identifying a person to get in the court has been difficult. Back to you. A mess in so many ways. All right, Sean. Well, the five passengers in a submersible that went missing Sunday on an undersea trip to view the Titanic wreckage are now presumed dead. The Coast Guard confirming a few hours ago debris found on the ocean floor near the famous shipwreck is from the Ocean Gate submersible Titan. Experts saying the vessel likely imploded amid the pressure of the deep sea. The worst fears of many were confirmed this afternoon in the search for the missing submersible. This morning, an ROV or remote operated vehicle from the vessel Horizon Arctic discovered the tail cone of the Titan submersible approximately 1,600 feet from the bow of the Titanic on the seafloor. The ROV subsequently found additional debris. In consultation with experts from within the Unified Command, the debris is consistent with the catastrophic loss of the pressure chamber. Upon this determination, we immediately notified the families. <laughs> Lost aboard the missing sub, Stockton Rush, CEO of Ocean Gate, the company leading the voyage. A French researcher known as Mr. Titanic, who's been to the wreck more than three dozen times. Aviation company chairman and adventure explorer Hamish Harding and a Pakistani businessman and his teenage son. On behalf of the United States Coast Guard and the entire Unified Command, I offer my deepest condolences to the families. Investigators don't yet know exactly when the catastrophic implosion happened, but ahead at 6.30 on NBC Nightly News, Tom Costello has reaction from friends of passengers. Tom looks at what could have gone wrong, who's responsible, and who is paying for this mission. 
Former Detroit police chief turned candidate for governor James Craig among those reacting to new charges in the signature fraud scandal that got five Republicans, including him, kicked off the primary ballot. A Warren couple and a third man are now accused of turning in those bogus signatures. Rod Maloney live tonight with what Craig and the other aggrieved candidates here are saying. Rod. Well, you know, Devin, uh, James Craig was the front runner, at least uh, by all accounts, until he wasn't and he was off the ballot. He said he was happy that they have these arrests today. And he actually agrees with the attorney general in her assessment that there was a lot of greed involved here with these companies that collect signatures getting hit from all corners with people waving money at them. Yes, it was greed, but. More nefarious than that, somebody wanted me off the ballot. And I will tell you, the great supporters of Michigan, the people that wanted me to continue on uh, in this race, they know there's something wrong. The two people arrested are 36-year-old Sean Wilmoth and his 37-year-old wife, Jamie Wilmoth Gooden of Warren, facing a couple of dozen felony counts of election law forgery and conducting a criminal enterprise. A third, Willie Reed, is still on the run. Craig says they took choice out of the voters' hands. Hopefully these bad actors might want to provide information. They say, well, we were also paid by X. Don't know. Another candidate impacted by the bogus signatures was West Side businesswoman Donna Brandenburg. This was such a big deal today. She attended today's press conference where the attorney general announced the charges, and she is glad to see these arrests. They interfered with our election. This is not just a felony. This is, this is tampering with our election process. The AG suggested new and tighter regulations on Michigan elections. Brandenburg believes that's the last thing we need. Further regulation does nothing. It does nothing for this country except for as a barrier for entry. Perry Johnson, who's now running for president, was also tossed off the ballot. Here's a statement from him today. Had these three petition gatherers not engaged in fraudulent criminal activity, it is highly likely that either Chief Craig or myself would be governor today. There must be consequences for breaking the law and tampering with elections. I am glad to see these charges brought against these three individuals to hold them accountable for their actions and grateful for the professionalism of the attorney general's office in handling this matter. Chief Craig, by the way, agreed with Perry's statement. Reporting live, Rod Maloney, Local 4. Boy, it has been, what a trap trip it has been, that's for sure. All right, Rod. Detroit police asking for the public's help to find a man who attacked and robbed another man inside a business. Happened last Friday evening at a liquor store on 8 Mile near the Southfield Freeway. Police say the two men exchanged words before the suspect, pictured here on the left, physically assaulted the other man, then stole money out of his pockets. The suspect left in a dark colored sedan. Take a good look there. I know it's hard to see, but if you recognize that person, please call DPD's 8th Precinct or Crime Stoppers. That number is 1-800-SPEAK-UP. Have you seen the ads targeting men with low T? A growing number of men are using testosterone replacement therapy, but experts caution little is known about how that impacts their broader health, specifically the heart. The FDA required the makers of testosterone therapies to conduct safety trials, and tonight one of the study sites is sharing the results. The study involved about 5,000 men between the ages of 45 and 80 with low testosterone. Participants had heart disease or were at high risk for it. They were all experiencing symptoms of low testosterone, such as decreased sexual desire, loss of body hair, and depression. The participants were split into two groups. One received testosterone gel and the other a placebo. Dr. Stephen Nissen led the research at the Cleveland Clinic question we were asking was, were there more cardiovascular events in men who were getting testosterone compared to men who were getting a placebo? The answer is that there were not. They were almost identical numbers of events in the placebo group and in the men taking testosterone. The men were only followed for 21 months, so there's no data on long-term risks. While they didn't find an increased risk of heart attack or stroke, Nissen cautions there are other safety concerns. There were, was a higher rate of venous thromboembolism, that's clots in the legs. Uh, it wasn't a large number, but it was, you know, an imbalance uh, toward testosterone. And in fact, the current guidelines suggest that men who have had clots in their legs 
should not be treated with testosterone. That was probably the most important and most serious adverse event that was observed. And so Dr. Nissen says the testosterone group also experienced more kidney issues and AFib, an irregular heart rhythm. So he cautions men against using testosterone therapy unless it's truly needed and of course recommends a conversation with your doctor.